Hi, this is Don Krauss. Welcome to the Carbon Pricing Workstream. I'm one of the co-facilitators. Uh, and today we have with us Alex Hanafi, the Senior Manager of Multilateral Climate Strategy and a Senior Attorney at the Environmental Defense Fund's Global Climate Program. Alex is going to lead a conversation on how unresolved understandings within Article 6 of the Paris Climate Agreement could impact the development of carbon pricing. Uh, Alex will also discuss how minilateral carbon market coalitions could establish much needed standards. In his work at the Environmental Defense Fund, Alex coordinates research and advocacy programs designed to promote policies and build institutions that effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the globe. And within this framework, Alex focuses on emissions cap and trade programs, legal issues in the international climate negotiations, and environmental governance. He leads EDS advocacy at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, where he works with policymakers to identify and implement high integrity standards to guide climate policy designs, including the use of economic incentives like carbon pricing for environmental protection and linkage among cli climate markets, carbon markets. So, Alex, we're really, really glad that you're here today and we look forward to the conversation. Well, thanks for, uh, for inviting me, Don, and, and hello, James, and others. Um, and, and thanks, uh, in particular, for those who have come off their vacation to, uh, to participate in the discussion. It looks like we'll have a pretty small group, so I think this could be you know, even more of an informal discussion than, than maybe um, we had even hoped for in the beginning, which would be, which would be great. Um, so my my presentation today is really intended to kind of look at what the what the Paris Agreement means for cooperation on carbon markets or carbon pricing. Uh, most of the discussions in the UNFCCC thus far have have really been in the mode of carbon markets um, rather than the idea of purely carbon pricing. So that's the context in which much of this will will be discussed. Um, and maybe just to introduce myself briefly, I should say uh, my name is Alex Hanafi. I'm an attorney with the Environmental Defense Fund in uh, in Washington D.C. And uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of, of, of background on, on on who we are, maybe as a way to kind of segue into what we do uh, around the UNFCCC and carbon pricing and and what happened in in, in Paris. So let me just uh, move ahead then to a brief introduction of, of who we are for those who may not be as familiar with, with EDF. So maybe the best way to describe it is what we are not. Uh, we are a non-governmental, non-profit, non-partisan uh, environmental advocacy organization. Uh, we have about a little over one million members. Um, we were founded in, in 1967, originally um, by uh, scientists who were leading the charge to ban DDT uh, because of its uh, detrimental effects on the environment. Um, and uh, since then, we've grown to en encompass a wide range of different environmental challenges, really trying to tackle the most serious environmental problems that, that we see out there um, using um, a key kind of set of foundational ideas, which are essentially starting with sound science um, and then uh, building on that with, by, by using efficient incentive-based solutions that can reconfigure markets so that they help rather than harm the Earth's uh, life-sustaining systems. So that's, that's a, a part of how we have gotten into the work at the UNFCCC is, is through this idea of using incentives to, uh, to change the dynamics around carbon pollution globally. So uh, EDF itself is uh, it's headquartered in New York, uh, but we have offices and operations all around the world. We have over 500 staff, including scientists, economists, um, lawyers like myself, policy and, and, and other experts. Um, we have extensive operations in China. We do a lot of low-carbon development work in India, um, and uh, we have a significant uh, set of partners in Brazil and the Amazon working particularly on uh, reducing emissions from, from deforestation um, in, in Brazil and the Amazon, uh, as well as work in Mexico. And, and uh, not all of this is climate related, of course. We work on a variety of different issues. Um, but everywhere we are here is, is uh, a particular focus for our climate work in particular. So, so with that as an introduction, let's jump into a, a, a little uh, 
a little uh, crystal ball into what I'm going to talk about in the rest of our time together. So the, the, my talk today in three bullets is essentially this. What, is it, what does the Paris Agreement actually say about carbon markets or carbon pricing? And the answer is literally very little, but uh, symbolically and uh, experientially a lot. And I'll talk about why I say that in a minute. Uh, second, what's the role for the UN going forward now that Paris is over? What's going to happen next? And then third, look a little bit about what might happen outside of the UNFCCC, outside of the United Nations climate negotiations. How might um, minilateral coalitions or plurilateral cooperation among jurisdictions help in advancing carbon pricing and carbon markets going forward? So let's jump into a little bit of context on uh, carbon markets in the Paris Agreement. How, did this, how, how have they been discussed thus far? How did we get to the point where they were going to become part of the Paris Agreement? So a couple um, perhaps paradoxical uh, pieces to this. The first is that, legally speaking, there was no new authority that was needed in the Paris Agreement for countries to cooperate uh, on carbon market or carbon pricing development. So there was no new authority that needed to be granted by the UN to say that countries could trade units between each other or cooperate in harmonizing carbon pricing policies. None of that was needed. They had retained that sovereign right. In addition to that fact, um, you had the fact that there was strong ideological opposition uh, in the run-up to Paris to markets from a few countries. These were particularly some um, Latin American countries with uh, current socialist governments, um, including Bolivia, Venezuela, a few others, that had a, an ideological opposition to the use of markets in the climate context. So with these two factors, one, mention of markets or carbon pricing was not needed in the agreement legally, and two, many were kind of vehemently opposed to it. How did you get this into the agreement, considering the agreement had to be done by consensus. Everyone had to agree on it. Well, they did get it in, and I think there are uh, several reasons for it. The first is that there was really widespread interest in using markets, uh, even though that term is never used in the agreement. There was widespread interest in using these kinds of economic incentives to uh, drive pollution down and to, to drive investment up. So uh, this is, I think, recognized or, or reflected in the facts on the ground, the fact that over 50 jurisdictions around the world have already implemented emissions trading systems and more have, have put in place carbon pricing systems, if you, you can add to that number with those that have put in taxes. So it, you know, with the fact that that many jurisdictions are already doing this, it would be odd if an international agreement didn't recognize that or, or mention it in some way. And so I think that's part of the reason um, that, that – the markets and, and carbon markets got into the agreement. Uh, the other kind of key part of it was that even those countries that don't have carbon markets or don't currently have carbon pricing systems, in the NDCs, in other words, the nationally determined contributions, the, the, the climate pledges that countries put forward in the run-up to Paris, this, these were put in place by well over 180 countries, uh, constituting about 99% of global emissions. About half of those countries said in their national statements that they were open to the idea of using carbon markets or some form of carbon pricing uh, to achieve their climate goals. So you really do have a, a broad base of countries that are interested in this. So the other reason, and part of the reason they're interested in this, is because there is a sense that these tools can lead to greater cost effectiveness of mitigation action. And as a result, they can allow countries to go farther than they otherwise might if they weren't using these tools. And that gets to the issue of ambition, which was so critical to the success of the Paris Agreement, enshrining a, a um, goal of trying to limit emissions to well below 2 degrees Celsius and to pursue efforts to keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius rise above pre-industrial um, uh, temperature. That, uh, that was a major achievement in Paris, but there is widespread recognition that the existing targets that countries have put forward are not going to get us there. So ambition is really a, a key theme, and markets are seen as contributing to that ambition. I think that's another reason that they were included. We need all the available tools in the toolkit to, to get to the ambition that we need. Third, there were uh, a number of other issues that some countries cared about. Even if those countries didn't care about markets that much, 
um, or even ideologically opposed markets. They were things they wanted. And so they were able to trade off their opposition to markets uh, in order to get other things. This is a negotiation, and those kinds of things happen all the time in these negotiations. Uh, then finally, everyone could see themselves in the agreed text. The actual article where the carbon market provisions were, were um, finalized, this is Article 6, which I'll talk about in a second, that Article 6 has had a, a number of different components. And the negotiators did a good job of making sure that every country's interest was somehow reflected somewhere in that Article 6, so that each country could say, you know what, I see myself in here. Part of what I wanted is in here. I can go along with it. Um, and one way they did that was to actually avoid the word markets anywhere in the agreement. They never, that word doesn't exist. You can search the Paris Agreement back and forth. It's not there. Carbon markets is not there. And that's partly because, as I mentioned, there was some ideological opposition to the, even the use of the term markets or the use of markets. So they found some other words to describe it. And we'll see what those words are now. So there, there are two, um, two kinds, really, of, uh, of voluntary um, emissions trading carbon market systems that were recognized in the Paris Agreement. And these are both in Article 6. And the first one is up on the screen now. This is in Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement, um, which is the, the decentralized, this is a decentralized kind of bottom-up approach um, that could include clubs of, of carbon markets, countries cooperating with each other on a bilateral or plurilateral basis. Um, so this, in this provision, Article 6, you can see some of the key language here. Um, the, the markets, instead of using the word markets, they say internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. That's the new UNFCCC acronym, ITMOs. Uh, they've got to create these. Every, every UNFCCC conference, they've got to have some new acronyms. So um, this is one of the ones they created. Um, these are also referred to as cooperative approaches. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's about uh, transferring units between jurisdictions. It's about carbon markets. And here, the UNFCCC's role is rather limited in this Article 6.2. Um, these are parties who are engaging in this, in this transfers of these ITMOs. And the parties shall apply robust accounting uh, when they're doing these, these transfers. Uh, so the UN's role here is really limited to what you see here, guidance. They're going to provide guidance to countries about accounting, and particularly about avoiding double counting. Uh, and this was really critical. This, is a, this avoidance of double counting was a, a hot topic in the run-up to Paris, um, and it's a really important piece. It's often, often overlooked, I think, in the analyses. But the agreement, both here and in several other places, there are at least six different mentions in the Paris Agreement of the need to avoid double counting. And those strong provisions were important um, to make sure that every ton of emissions reductions that a country achieves is only counted once. That's a, a critical safeguard for environmental integrity, and it's a prerequisite for effective carbon markets uh, to reduce pollution. So we were, we were, I think, pleased that that really got in there, and EDF was, was strongly advocating for that key provision of avoidance of double counting getting into the agreement. Um, the, uh, like I said, this, this provision here is seen as really establishing a really clear path for countries to move ahead with these kind of bilateral or plurilateral trading arrangements on this kind of voluntary, bottom-up, decentralized basis. So this, this article, 6.2, really tries to essentially mimics the kind of hybrid, bottom-up, top-down structure of the Paris Agreement. It's the cooperation will be bottom-up. There will be some top-down guidance. Uh, but the real top-down element of carbon markets comes in the next uh, section of Article 6, which is Article 6.4. So this is the place where the parties created a, a new mechanism, a new carbon market mechanism that's called, it, it, the, the name of this exactly is still uh, uh, up for, uh, for, the naming rights have not been resolved, but people are calling it essentially a mechanism to contribute to the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and support sustainable development. It's too long. They need some acronym, but they haven't figured that out yet. Um, so this one, this mechanism is a centralized, UNFCCC-governed market mechanisms for those who want to use that. Um, 
and, and you can see from this one that this is, this is essentially, it, it doesn't mention JI or CDM or the previous flexibility mechanisms of the Kyoto Protocol, but it's seen as being the successor to those, uh, to those mechanisms. Uh, there were a number of countries in the run-up to Paris that uh, had concerns about the CDM, about it continuing in the post-2020 regime, um, didn't want to see it continuing, and so they needed to make some changes. They needed to uh, pre create some kind of new um, mechanism for those countries that were interested in using a centralized mechanism. And that's what this Article 6.4 mechanism is intended to, to be. Uh, the exact details have still to be worked out. These are more kind of broad-level principles that you see here. Um, but this has the potential to be an improvement on the previous UNFCCC mechanisms uh, like the, the CDM. And under the decision that accompanies the Paris Agreement, so the, the Paris Agreement is the overarching international treaty agreement, and then the decision that countries adopt at the same time, which really kind of lays out the infrastructure for implementing the Paris Agreement, under that decision, countries agreed to uh, develop the procedures and guidelines um, for this Article 6.4 mechanism. So the details are going to be worked out over the coming years about what exactly this, look like, this looks like. And under the decision, they also agreed to develop the guidance to ensure the avoidance of double counting. Um, so that's going to be something that's going to, that's going to be negotiated. How exactly do you do that? What does that look like in practice in a, in a post-Kyoto world, where, which is decentralized and bottom-up? That still needs to be worked out. Um, and uh, it will be somewhat, I think, uh, hopefully over the next year or two that can be resolved. But it's going to be complicated because of the various types of NDCs, the various types of contributions that countries have put forward and how heterogeneous they are uh, as opposed to the, 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 pre, the Kyoto world that we're, that we're transitioning from. So um, as you can tell, there are some unresolved questions and some important next steps uh, for the elaboration of these market mechanisms uh, that were created in, in, uh, under the Paris Agreement. So the first big question is, what is the scope of the guidance under that decentralized um, uh, market mechanism I mentioned under 6.2? So it's clear that it has to provide the, 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 the conference of the parties, the, the parties that are party to the Paris Agreement, they will have to provide some guidance about accounting. That's, that's clear. Um, uh, including how to avoid double counting. But there are some parties who interpret that guidance, that Article 6.2 sentence that I, that I showed, um, to be broader than that. And they interpret it as including guidance on transparency. They in include it as interpreting guidance, including guidance on environmental integrity. They, in they interpret it as including guidance on sustainable development. They see the COP as having a a role in um, developing guidance on all of those issues, whereas there are a number of parties, especially many developed country parties as well as some developing country parties, that see that um, guidance as, as really being intended to only apply to accounting. Now, the definition of accounting is not spelled out in the Paris Agreement, and this gets me to the next bullet, which is there are a number of key terms in both 6.2 and 6.4 that are not defined. And so there is going to be an ongoing process in the UNFCCC to kind of to come to some sort of understanding of what was really meant by these provisions. And this is not uncommon in the in the UNFCCC negotiations. Uh, after a, a big meeting, there is often some kind of buyer's remorse uh, or a questioning of what was actually agreed in the final hours of the agreement. Um, and these market provisions were the last parts of the Paris Agreement to come together. So they were the final bits of text forwarded to the Secretariat in late, late morning hours um, in, the, in overtime at Paris. So uh, they, were, they were the last things to be agreed, very contentious. And not everyone necessarily was on the same page, it looks like, when they actually forward these things to the Secretariat um, in those final hours. So that's going to be an ongoing uh, discussion. And then another big question is, what exactly is Article 6.9? These are non-market approaches. I didn't include a detail on this in the slides because it's a bit different from the work that we're, that we're talking about now. But these are essentially non-market approaches. Um, the framework for non-market approaches was established under 6.9. They need to think about and define what a non-market approach is. Different countries have different interpretations of what a non-market approach means. Um, 
and that's a, 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 a big question mark over the coming years is how they develop that. But I, I include it here because it's likely that the pace of negotiations on Article 6.2 and 6.4 will um, be in parallel with the pace for 6.9, these non-market approaches. Um, it's unlikely that those who are really interested in 6.9 will let 6.2 and 6.4 go much faster than 6.9. Uh, if past experience is anything to go by. So what that suggests is that this may take some time. And there was very slow progress at the first post-Paris meeting of the parties. This was the meeting in Bonn the, um, uh, that happened in, in May, uh, where they were supposed to make some progress on these various questions. They did not make much. They did call for submissions from parties and observer organizations uh, on each of these um, articles and sub-articles, but without any kind of guiding questions or any kind of specifics uh, of the focus. So it's likely to be a fairly general set of submissions from countries, which um, it will take time to sort out and make more concrete. So it, that kind of slow pace is, is, in my mind, and I think it's growing recognition that that is inconsistent with the sense of ambition and urgency that came out of Paris. Um, and particularly in light of the fact that the Paris Agreement may enter into force as early as the end of this year or perhaps early next year, that's a real sign of momentum on climate action. It's something that we think is, should be encouraged and should be reflected in the pace of negotiations to get the Paris Agreement up and running. But um, it looks like it's going to take a while for the, these important decisions to be made. So this, uh, I think, has prompted many to take some uh, – increased interest in the idea of coalitions of, uh, of market-interested countries, countries who want to cooperate on carbon pricing and carbon markets, to get together and talk to each other about how they could collaborate on standards um, that could ensure environmental integrity and could perhaps move a little bit faster and a little bit farther than the UNFCCC might in the coming years. So there, I think, is a question about what, what could that complementary role be for minilateral cooperation. And part of the reason that this is uh, an important topic is that the, the role of the UNFCCC is, is limited in, um, in this new world, in this Paris Agreement world uh, that we're all entering. So while it does have full authority and oversight over the design of that centrally governed offset crediting mechanism, that's Article 6.4, it has a much more circumscribed role on bilateral or plurilateral trading through that bottom-up approach of, of 6.2. Um, the UNFCCC's role is likely to be limited to uh, accounting guidance, providing that ac guidance on accounting, whatever that accounting means. Um, and I think that, that that way that they parsed it was a recognition of the challenges and the limitations of a consensus approach to uh, creating markets. There are many countries who don't want to use market tools um, or carbon pricing tools in their toolbox. And um, that, uh, that's fine. It makes sense. But it's going to be hard for all countries to agree on something if many countries just really don't have an interest in it. And so that has, I think, prompted more to think about how could a, a complementary plurilateral grouping of countries come together and create a coalition of carbon markets that could help establish some common standards, some common guidelines, uh, that could help ensure the environmental integrity of international emissions trading. That would be, I think, the first step of a, of a complementary uh, um, carbon market coalition. And then later on, if the members of that coalition chose, they could go to the next step of creating a, a common trading infrastructure, all the pieces that you need to make that trading actually work. So things like registries, things like a, a common trading platform, things like that that they might need. But the first step, and I think the, the place where, uh, if this does go forward, the place that's most likely to see progress is in countries getting together and talking about what might be some of the common standards um, that we would want to develop so that our systems could, if they wanted to later, link together. Um, we saw that that was the way that the, the, the California-Quebec systems eventually linked. They started out by simply sharing information about their, uh, their programs sharing information about how they were going to develop them through the Western Climate Initiative many, many years before they actually decided to, to um, link their systems 
together. So that may provide some hints about how carbon market cooperation may evolve in the, in the, over the coming months and years. So that's it. Um, a few key takeaways uh, that I think are highlights of, of uh, what happened in Paris and the way forward. First, I think the, the Paris Agreement, it, it's a recognition of the growth of carbon markets around the world. I think it will continue to, the Paris Agreement will contribute to the momentum around carbon markets. It may contribute to further domestic development of carbon markets, um, but it didn't create that momentum. Uh, that was already happening before the Paris Agreement came. It kind of recognized that, I think. But I think it will help, particularly for those countries that look to the UN for some kind of um, blessing for their different mitigation activities. Uh, I think they, they can now see in the Paris Agreement a recognition that carbon markets uh, have a place in a future um, era of, of climate action. So that's, I think, uh, an important uh, fact from, from Paris. Second is that um, what we saw, I, I, I think what we're, what we're seeing in Paris is that um, there is a need to broaden participation in climate action. You had more countries than have ever um, put forward climate pledges before, put forward those climate pledges in the run-up to Paris. Um, and uh, many of them have expressed an interest in using carbon markets to achieve their goals. That coordination on, that's, that could help with building carbon market integrity, help with environmental integrity, that can help broaden that participation in climate action, and it could help promote uh, more ambitious reductions in carbon emissions that we need to help achieve the, the, the two-degree or 1.5-degree target. Uh, the UNFCCC's role is an important one to understand going forward. It seems like their role will be more limited um, than it was, for instance, in the KP flex me flexible mechanisms, the JII and CDM. Um, it's, we're, the the post-Paris world is more of a decentralized world that really is going to depend on uh, climate action at the local level. And uh, those local carbon markets are going to have more of an influence, I think, on the development of that 62 um, uh, system than the UNFCCC will itself. And that brings me to the final piece, the minilateral coalition of carbon markets. Uh, this has the potential to add to the Paris momentum by creating common standards and guidelines for environmental integrity, and then perhaps informing the development of the Paris Agreement's multilateral accounting guidance. Uh, we saw a similar kind of beneficial effect from complementary initiatives in other parts of the climate negotiations particularly in the forest sector. Um, a number of countries who were interested in uh, forest protection came together under the mantle of the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility many years ago and helped develop a set of um, principles and standards uh, for uh, forest protection and financing of forest protection that eventually found their way in to the UNFCCC guidance. They migrated over and helped the UNFCCC to come to agreement on similar standards. And it's possible that a complementary kind of coalition of carbon market jurisdictions could do the same thing, essentially develop a set of high integrity standards that could help the UNFCCC uh, when it finally is able to decide on what it's going to do on the accounting guidance um, under 6.2. So um, we'll be there for these next steps. There's a lot of work to, that needs to continue to be done, as you can tell, um, starting in, in Marrakesh this November. EDF will be there to make sure that, the, that, that uh, the pressure is on to keep these items moving forward, because we think they are so important uh, to creating incentives for countries to do more. So uh, look forward to, to talking with you all about this. If you have questions uh, or comments or reactions, uh, would love to, love to hear. Thanks. <laughs> Alex, thank you. That, that was excellent and, and, and very, very detailed. Um, for those of you who just came on recently, that was Alex Hanafi, a senior manager of, uh, of multilateral climate strategy and a senior attorney at the Environmental Defense Fund's Global Climate Program. So um, if you have, do you have, whoever has a question for Alex, please feel free just to dive right in. or I will ask one myself. Um, Alex, in terms of these mini-laterals, um, you know, we, we, you're talking about mini-laterals, but if you get some rather large markets together, uh, to, you know, something that's to the order of the U.S. and the EU, for example, or something at, at that lab, level, mm -hmm. um, would that have the impact then of being able to draw many others 
into this process? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, I think they're drawing on lessons from other trading regimes, in particular the, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which, which eventually formed into the, the, the World Trade Organization. Um, what seems to be a deciding factor in the success of these kinds of trading arrangements is establishing a critical market mass of participants who, who control enough of the trade in that item or good or, or service that others want into that club. They want to, to join the club because they see that's where the action is. And they're willing to take on the disciplines and rules and, and standards of that club because of the benefits that, that membership in the club provides. So I think if you had, a, if you had some of the big um, carbon trading jurisdictions get together and establish that critical market mass, um, it would, I think it would have a kind of a tipping point effect in getting other countries and other jurisdictions to uh, want to join and to want to take on the disciplines that that kind of a of membership would entail. Now, the exact size of what that market is, I think, is 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 a little unclear, um, but uh, I think the concept is is an important one. And I think it's important to recognize you don't need to have everybody on board right from the start. That's the key part. You can start small and build from there. The original GATT negotiations um, were really kind of initiated by the UK and the US and a few others. There were a relatively small number of um, participants in that initial discussion. And it grew over time to what it is now. Um, so when it first went into effect, I think it had something like 20 countries in it. Um, and now it has, you know, well, close to all the countries in the world, but certainly not all are there. And so I think that's that's a we looked at that as a as a possible lesson in looking at how um, these minilateral coalitions of carbon markets might might develop. And I think it's a it's a key point to keep in mind. Start small and and build from there. Thanks. Who else has a question here? Um, Bob Archer. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, uh, could you uh, elaborate a bit upon the discussions or the activities underway, respectively, for what you've described here, the carbon markets, cap and trade, and also the uh, carbon tax policy, which is in several countries? Yeah, sure. Bob, are you, do you mean kind of what are, what are the, the next steps for, for, for these um, pieces that I described in the Paris Agreement? What is the state of play, respectively, among oh, countries yeah. in considering these two different policy approaches on, on pricing carbon? Yeah, got it. Uh, so the state of play, essentially, I, I think I, maybe I mentioned this in the, in the beginning of the um, presentation. At the UNFCCC level, um, there is a different set of conversations than happening maybe at the domestic level in a number of countries. So at the UNFCCC level, the, the primary um, uh, topic for conversation has really revolved around carbon markets. So this is, I think, uh, maybe a testament to the legacy of the Kyoto Protocol and its focus on different carbon market um, uh, tools that provided there, emissions trading, uh, the clean development mechanism, joint implementation. They were really trying in the Paris Agreement to think about the next generation of that kind of international carbon market cooperation. So there really was not much discussion of carbon taxes, um, you know, the, the carbon pricing such as it exists in the UNFCCC context is really mostly about, at least in the formal negotiations, about carbon markets and about emissions trading systems. Now, obviously, in the domestic level, there are different policies in place in different countries. Um, South Africa is, is one of the countries that uh, has, it has been looking at tax. I think they may have even implemented a tax uh, on certain sectors. Um, there are other countries, you know, other provinces and subnational jurisdictions like British Columbia that have put in place carbon taxes. Um, how those interact with each other and how they may interact with a, with a carbon market is a topic of research uh, for, from a number of, of academics and others who look at, you know, are there ways of linking these together and making that, helping them to cooperate together? It's complicated. It's complicated to try to link these heterogeneous policies together. The simplest and kind of cleanest methods um, are linking emissions trading systems that have similar 
design elements, um, particularly similar design elements on key pieces uh, of their architecture, like um, the uh, uh, like the, the the design of their uh, offset systems, offset trading systems, like the um, whether they have price callers or not. There are some factors that are really important to get to be the exact same, if or at least very closely harmonized, if you want these emissions trading systems to link. So that gets back to what I was saying earlier about the importance of, of sharing information, coming up with common standards and guidelines. As more countries develop these carbon markets or think about putting them in place, that kind of, of um, homework, doing your homework about what you, how you might want to design it so you keep your, your flexibility open to cooperate with other jurisdictions going forward, that kind of homework is going to be important for, for countries, countries to do. Uh, but right now the state of play around carbon markets is that there are about over 50 different jurisdictions around the world that have implemented or, 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 um, or put in place emissions trading mm -hmm. systems. That includes about a billion people, that, that covers about a billion people on the planet after China puts in place its national trading system in 2017, that's the, the schedule at least, um, that number will rise to 2 billion people. And so I think that, again, is a, is a you know, the fact that almost a third of the world's population will be under some sort of emissions trading system uh, is reflected in the, in the Paris Agreement. They couldn't really ignore that uh, and needed to recognize it in, in some way uh, and try to find ways for those jurisdictions to cooperate with each other to do more. Uh, and that's what, the real, that's what the real promise is, that they can do more because of that cooperation. Wouldn't the uh, club concept you mentioned, which I think goes back to William Nordhaus at Yale, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't that apply as likewise to a carbon tax policy? Yeah, there could be a variety of different types of clubs that could be put together, and a number of, of proponents have, have suggested different types. You could have uh, renewable energy clubs. You could have uh, clubs of, around climate finance. Um, you could have clubs around carbon taxation. Um, the ones that, that I'm most familiar with relate to clubs around emissions trading systems and how they would link together. Um, that's where I've seen the most research and the most um, kind of analysis. But there are, there, you could apply the same concept to different types of policy measures. Um, the question is, I think in any kind of club, for to, to be a true club, the, the benefits of membership have to really be exclusive. Uh, that's what, what's what provides the impetus for, for uh, potential participants to want to join and to take on the, the, the rules or standards that, re, that are required for, for membership. So I think with, a, with any kind of club, there needs to be a really careful consideration of what are the, what are the benefits of joining, um, what are the, the, the potential burdens or costs to a member of joining, and, and do those benefits outweigh the, outweigh the costs. So it's a, it's a concept, I think, that will be and needs to be looked at for a, for a variety of these different types of measures that countries are going to put in place to, to tackle climate, including taxation. Um, and I think it's a, it's a question of what, what, what would they do together? How could they make that cooperation achieve more than the, the sum of its parts? That's the real, um, that's the real challenge and, and opportunity here, too. What is EDF's uh, overall view at this point as an organization with regard to carbon taxation uh, versus uh, cap and trade carbon markets? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think we actually had a uh, there was an op-ed that was published by um, our, our one of our senior economists as well as our uh, global climate lead um, that looked at the question of carbon tax versus cap and trade, and the essential point that they made was. Um, what we need to do is we need to, we need to price and limit carbon pollution. Uh, and the, the debate about tax versus, versus uh, emissions trading system or tax versus carbon market, uh, I think is a, it, 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 um, it in some ways is a theoretical debate because of the, from what the evidence seems to show, they could achieve similar things. It's just a different, it's just a slightly different approach between the two, the, two of them. Uh, about what they limit. Because we are an environmental organization um, and because we see 
um, limits on carbon pollution as a kind of natural extension of the need to reduce carbon pollution. EDF has tended to focus its advocacy around emissions trading systems because they place an explicit limit on carbon pollution, and you can judge them uh, very easily through that and enforce through that limit. Uh, but the real point is to just start doing something. Um, start putting in place policies that reduce that, that pollution. And whether it's a, whether it's a carbon tax or uh, an emissions trading system, um, something needs to get started and needs to happen now, if not many, many years ago. <laughs> Where, where's the option? Yeah. Bob, Bob, hold on. I want to see if anyone else has a question and wants to get into the conversation here. Hold on. I just want to see, did anyone else want to jump in at this point since Bob has gotten to ask a few? Okay. Um, Can you give us the source on the op-ed? That'd be good to read. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send that around. Don, should I, should I, send that to you and then you could put it in the would it be go to the memory bank or you can share yeah. it with the folks on the call all of the above if you wanted to put it in the chat box right now you can or send it to me and I'll send it to around to people later on and put it in the memory bank okay great yeah I'll find that uh, it'll take me a little bit to find it and I'll send it around thanks so Alex on the undefined terminology not undefined but with the terminology where there's some question on definition in 6.2 and in 6.4 um, you were a little bit concerned about a, a, a lack of, um, of it being, you know, that something that has to get done right now. How do you see that playing out? Is that going to be able to come to some kind of resolution around Marrakesh or will that be, you know, more towards 2020? Where do you see yeah. that, that that will be, you know, based on your experience with past negotiations? Um, and I guess the other piece of that is, you know, what role is there for organizations like uh, the Citizens Climate Engagement and, and Citizens Climate Lobby, um, you know, to, to be part of that conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, you know, the Kyoto Protocol, from the time it was negotiated to the time it actually entered into force, I, I think it was about five or six years. Uh, before it actually entered into force. <clears throat> and it looks like the Paris Agreement is going to be uh, maybe a year, maybe at most two years. So that's a, that's a big step forward. And that is, I think, a, a, a sign of the sense of, of um, not only urgency, but also widespread agreement on the value of the Paris Agreement's content and structure as a foundation for future action. So I think there is a recognition among countries that um, they do need to make progress, uh, and they can't just kind of, we don't have a lot of time left. They do need to set up the infrastructure so that the Paris Agreement can actually truly enter into force as an operational entity rather than just kind of as a theoretical construct. Um, but, you know, this, the UNFCCC, like I said, it's, a, it's 195 countries operating on the basis of consensus. And any time you have that kind of a structure with, with that wide participation, it's going to take some time. Um, from the talking with a variety of countries in Bonn and, and since then, I think there is a kind of an informal target of getting most of the key transparency rules, accounting rules, um, in place around 2018. That seems to be the number, that the, the date that uh, countries are trying to aim at. So, you know, uh, about two years. Um, we'd like it to be earlier. We think it could be done earlier um, if they really focused on it. Uh, but uh, I think with the, the judging from past experience, getting all that agreed in two years um, it seems to many countries to be a, a, an accurate and, and even for them ambitious um uh, timeline to do it. So that's why I think it's important, if you do want to get stuff done earlier, think about places outside the UNFCCC that some of these discussions could take place, um, uh, complementary discussions could take place to help think about what some of these standards and guidelines might be for environmental integrity. If the UNFCCC can agree its own standards and, and guidelines earlier, then great. If not, then these complementary initiatives could help move the UNFCCC faster and help them be able to get stuff done quicker. So that's that's why I think we need a kind of all of the above <laughs> approach to, mm -hmm. to, um, to to get these standards in place, um, both at the, the mini lateral level and at the multilateral level. Okay. And 
In terms of 6.9 on non-market approaches and, and what's going to be happening around there, I mean, clearly from some of the conversations and questions we've had, you know, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby members are very concerned about, you know, where within this international agreement the concept of, you know, carbon tax, carbon fee comes through. Would that be a place in the, in the 6.9, the non-market approaches where that would exist or would it or what its closeness and how, how close it is to a market-based approach in terms of the mechanisms and the ways that it works make it more applicable in some of the other sections? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the term non-market is not defined in the agreement or in the decision text that accompanies the agreement. So I think there is room for uh, advocacy around um, uh, carbon taxation in that conversation. Uh, and thinking about how that might, what that, you know, how to how to encourage that in the non-market space. It's very open right now, so I think there is space for advocacy organizations to shape it in a way that they think would be um, would be useful. There is a mention in the, as I think I mentioned, there's a mention in the decision text about carbon pricing. The only place where carbon pricing actually appears in the Paris Agreement is in the decision text. I think it's paragraph 136. Uh, that says it's, it's a recognition of the importance of economic incentives um, in reducing carbon pollution. And it says including tools such as domestic policies and carbon pricing. So there's no action attached to that um, paragraph. There's no kind of call for further submissions or there's no kind of formal structure to develop that paragraph any further. So if you want a formal place to participate um, around carbon taxation, it, the non-market framework may be the, 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 the most tangible place uh, for you and your members to take a look and see. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're getting uh, close to the top of the hour here. Does, um, did anyone else uh, have a question here? James, I know you had had one earlier that you had been talking about. Yeah, I'm not sure that one's relevant at the moment. Um, what I wanted to ask about is, is you talked about uh, each club needing to have uh, its own values and benefits unique to the, the mini club or, or grouping. Um, I wonder if you had a perspective on the carbon pricing leadership and how, uh, whether that has its own values and benefits identified and also where that falls within Article 6. Yeah. So the, the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, or the, the, the is that what you're talking about, James? The, the, the grouping of countries, companies, yes. um, others who have endorsed these, the, the, these principles? And, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's something that EDF has been involved in, too, and we're, we're watching and participating in that with, uh, with a lot of hope about what it can achieve. I think it's still fairly early stages for that, um, for that process, um, and I think it's a... It, you know, I'm not exactly the, the, the membership criteria for it. Um, I don't have them. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I think they're fairly, you know, it's, it's fairly wide open um, in endorsing kind of the, 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 the role of carbon pricing um, as a tool to, to reduce emissions. Uh, I think that the, the, the discipline, the question about what, what disciplines does it impose um, on, on countries, what action is clear that they will be taking as a result of it, I think that's still to be determined a little bit. So it, it, it has the potential to evolve into something that could be really useful in a club, but I think it's still fairly early stages. But I'm, I'm curious if others have, have more experience with that and more thoughts about where, what that looks like right now and where, they think, where you think it, it, it might go. I think my interest in, in that group, to be honest, is is driven by the fact that the group of countries and organizations and regions included in it have policies much, much closer to what we advocate at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And they seem to be entering into it, my perception is they seem to be entering into it in the same way we engage, which is it's about sharing information about what works and cooperating rather than to trying to create a club that guarantees unique benefits to participants. That, but that's yeah. my perception. That's not necessarily reality. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think there is a, I mean, it, I want to be clear that uh, when I say that, you know, clubs could help with our, with, with the, our big kind of need of, of reducing emissions, they're certainly not the only tool uh, or kind of process that, that, that can help with that. I think this information sharing piece is critically important, and it, it can, it's useful on its own, um, and it can also lead, to, it could, among those countries or jurisdictions that want to, it could lead to further cooperation or more specific kinds of, of, of modes of cooperation on various policies. I, I mean, the example I think of is the Western Climate Initiative. That's what's most kind of prominent in my mind that, you know, started out as an information sharing uh, platform for various um, uh, jurisdictions uh, in North America to talk about um, their, their climate policies and it eventually evolved into a, uh, a, a system that helped California and Quebec actually link their emissions trading systems together. That's not the case for all Western Climate Initiative countries. Not all of them decide to link, but I think they all saw some benefits to that, that information sharing and, and kind of good practices uh, discussion that, that seems to be going on in the CPLC as well. I have one other uh, related question. Um, which is, is to do with negotiating style, um, which kind of extends it from just information sharing to the type of a, um, gaming theory that's very different to what I understand the, the COP negotiating stance has been up till now, which is, which is countries want to put the least in they can. Uh, which is the kind of I will if you will type commitment where people don't necessarily commit to do anything, but they say if there's a critical mass of things, uh, then I, I will commit to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered if you'd seen any evidence of that type of negotiating style yet, given your visibility of the different groups and, and um, mechanisms for trying to reduce greenhouse gases. Do you, do you mean? Do you mean have I seen that kind of um, negotiating style outside of the UNFCCC, or or have I seen it as in the follow up to Paris? Uh, either in Paris or as part of the UNFCCC. Yeah, yeah. I think there there that kind of narrative and that that's kind of the the default mode for much of the the climate negotiations. This is a this is a process that, as I said, operates by consensus. So what that tends to do is it tends to give power to the holdouts. Those who don't want to do something tend to, you know, essentially have a veto power. Now, that's not entirely true because the UNFCCC has essentially overridden um, a few lone objectors from time to time. A consensus does not mean unanimity. Um, but it, it is difficult if you've even got a few countries uh, among 190 plus that don't like something, they can effectively hold up progress. So that 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 power dynamic is a difficult one to overcome, and I think it's all the more reason to kind of wonder sometimes about how much the Paris Agreement actually did achieve. It achieved quite a bit. People had much lower expectations, I think, than 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 for some parts of it at least than than what it achieved. So that I think that dynamic is continuing. I think there is a disconnect between what countries say and do at the UNFCCC level and what they may say or do at the domestic level. Um, and I think one of the ways you see this is that the NDCs that come forward, the countries' commitments that they put forward to the, to the UNFCCC, most countries are fairly confident that they'll be able to, to meet those. Um, and they're careful about putting forward things that they, um, that they think they won't be able to achieve. So I think the result of that is that, you know, and this is a potentially optimistic result, that we shouldn't judge the uh, or project emissions necessarily at what the NDCs say they're going to be. It's likely that many countries may actually overachieve their NDCs because they because they put forward somewhat conservative um, uh, targets. So China is is most of the analysis I've seen suggests China is going to overachieve its NDC. Um, Europe has already overachieving its 2020 target and perhaps may, may overachieve its its 2030 target. Um, the U.S. is a bit more questionable. I think that'll depend on a number of factors, including potentially the outcome of the election uh, in a few months. Um, but those, you know, those are big emitters. And uh, if, if even China overachieves um, by, by some amount, that ha will have a huge difference on, on where we are. So I think that, uh, sure, the NDCs themselves, I think, are a, are a, are a, a, a reflection of that um, dynamic that, that you see. And I, I don't see that changing in the UNFCCC context. I think what's going to be really important 
going forward is, is more and more bilateral cooperation that can support a, a changed narrative at the UNFCCC. What I mean by that is things like China-U.S. collaboration, that, that cooperation between China and the U.S. in the run-up to Paris had a huge influence on the, the positive result, I think, that we saw in Paris. Um, and, and that hopefully will continue and it will continue to generate momentum that can be brought into the, the actual multilateral negotiations. So that's, that's, I think, something to watch going forward to see if that narrative is going to change. Well, Alex, thank you very, very much for your time and your presentation here. This has been excellent. Uh, we look forward to seeing how all of this progresses. Uh, if we have time for just one short question, um, I, I would uh, maybe hopefully short. I would just ask, uh, in terms of the what I'll call just use the shorthand of mitigation mechanism in uh, 6.4, um, the the overseeing body that's going to be designated by the COP is that a political scramble to see how that is developed and who's going to be on that? Or is that still um, waiting, uh, uh, not quite up to speed yet in terms of the negotiations on that? Correct. It's the latter. It's it's still it's still to be determined. Um, there are some initial thoughts about you know where where that might be housed and what it might look like, but there's nothing. Um, it's very early days in that in that discussion. It's not clear at all where where it's going to be, where that that what that body is going to be. That'll be interesting to follow. Well, yep. thank you very much, and um, thank you everyone who has joined us today, um, and for those who will be listening to this in the future. And once again, um, uh, uh, if you have a chance to take a look at the new carbon pricing workstream memory bank, uh, the uh, URL is in the chat box, but it's at engageforclimate.org slash cpw hyphen memory hyphen bank. Uh, we want your suggestions on what else needs to be added to it, and hopefully you'll be able to find some good information in it that you didn't know. So uh, we're meeting again next Thursday. As always, it'll be a work session, um, and uh, we will talk to everyone soon. Thanks, Don. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Don, and thanks, everyone, for joining and for the discussion. Much appreciated. Thanks, Thank Alex. you all. Take care. Take care. Bye.